Welcome to our podcast series of Coffee with Accord, where we discuss various peace and security related topics, including ongoing and emerging conflicts in Africa, policy developments, evolving theories, and innovative approaches to peace and security. Our guests are conflict resolution practitioners, experienced mediators, and policymakers within the peace and security landscape. Enjoy this episode and feel free to leave your comments. Coffee with Accord is published by the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes. The views and opinions expressed in this production do not reflect the views of Accord and its affiliates. The following episode may contain sensitive material, including descriptions of violence, sexual assault, or graphic descriptions of injuries against victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. Good day, and welcome to another episode of Coffee with Accord. My name is Savannah Walmart, and I will be your host for today. I am so excited to speak to today's guest, Rosen Borne, who's a community activist involved in combating all forms of violence in her home country, Kenya, from extrajudicial killings to gender-based violence during the global pandemic. But before we get to introducing Rose formally, I would like to encourage you to grab a cup of coffee and enjoy this clip, which will be set in the scene for our upcoming chat. Hope you have your coffee and are ready because without any further delay i'll be introducing today's guest rosen borne is a community activist who is championing youth and women peace and security issues rose founded her organization the legend kenya in 2013 when she was 22 years old in gorogocho her home community in northeastern nairobi rose is a community mobilizer and has vast practical experience in bringing together youths of a diverse background to speak about issues that affect them and the community as a whole during the pandemic, Rose has witnessed the hopelessness of gender-based violence victims and has since dedicated much of her work to try and prevent and mitigate the effects of this violence within her community. Rose, I would like to start with your passion for peace and people, which is abundantly clear. Tell us, what moments or influences have shaped who you are today? Thank you so much, um, uh, Savannah, for having me. And uh, the events that, that shaped my life is uh, growing up in the informal settlements of Nairobi and experiencing first-hand violence in, at the community level. This was not an easy thing because it is, it is a thing you see on a day-to-day basis. You don't learn it in books, you experience it first-hand. So I, I, really, I really felt that um, people were so vulnerable to an extent that um, they are okay with the situation as it is. And I began questioning myself and trying to do soul searching and I was also going through a very tough moment because as a result of learning uh, the effects of violence and um, how it affects uh, women at the community level, I, I lost a brother to crime and he was in prison for eight years. Upon his release, six months later, he was shot dead. And that really was like a wake up call for me. And I felt as a young woman, what can I do to bring an end to all this? And I have I've lost friends and close people to this, vi- this type of violence. And I see how women are left vulnerable. Women are widowed at a very tender age and they they have this uh, huge responsibility of taking care of children and they have this huge responsibility of trying to do uh, soul searching and trying to understand who they really are in life. So I felt that um, there are things we cannot 
uh, bring back we cannot bring back life but we can stop these young people from participating in criminal activities and as women we have a voice and these are people who listen to us if it's not your brother it's your husband it's your it's your close friend so i felt there was an important role that women especially young women could play in bringing to an end this issue of losing young people to their early graves thank you so much rose you are speaking to a lot of very um traumatic experiences that have led to led you to become the person that you are. Uh, tell us a little bit more about founding your organization, The Legend Kenya. Uh, why did you found, found it and to what extent has it evolved to doing the work that you do today? Thank you, Savannah. The Legend Kenya was found and um, immediately I lost my brother. I, I paused just to ask myself, what can I do? Because he's gone, but I still see his friends around. I still see other young people engaging in crime. I still see young girls going through pain. I still see mothers who lost their sons and just become insane. For, for a very long period of time, it was a, like an attack. The, the youths were just on the other side, extreme end of saying, these are killers, the, the cops are um, brutal, they are violent. And on the other side, I also noticed that the cops are there to um, make sure that they are making our community peaceful no matter what happens, be it forceful, be it um, uh, through brutality, they don't really care. So I felt it was important to have an umbrella that brings together, first of all, these young people. These young people who are hurting and are, are in such a, a life, a, a time in their life whereby they don't really understand how to go about um, the issues of violence, how to overcome traumatic events. Because you realize you can have up to a third generation still engaging in crime. So I ask myself, how can we cut this rope? How do we make sure we bring an end to this? Because in mind, I was bearing the, I was having the pain of women with me. When these young people are gone, they, are, they, they leave back children. These children grow up knowing what happened to their parents. Then at some point there is this urge of revenge Sometimes you notice that a parent just becomes, um, uh, just uh, abandons her responsibilities. A mother will just drink herself out and she's just okay with it. And children will be left just like that. We have child-headed households as a result of this. Children are young people, you see them working outside there to earn money so that they can come and feed their families. So I said it is important to talk, just start talking, start a conversation, a different conversation. Because anytime these young people meet, they have a conversation around what are we going to do tomorrow in regards to violence? Who is offering us um, a space maybe to go and, and, and cause chaos? I said it is important to first of all start a conversation about peace. And when I began this, it it became uh, as a as a as a, a way of of these people trying to just understand themselves. Then most of them used to ask me, but Rosie, why why do you think it is important to have uh, young people as peace champions in the community? I used to tell them, this community belongs to all of us. If you notice, most of the police in our communities are on not rotational leadership. They come and go. But when they leave, most of them leave us with wounds that will never heal. How about we start dealing with our wounds at the community level? Even if we have these security actors coming in, they're not coming in to kill us. They're coming in to understand. They are coming in to maintain law and order. But they are not coming in because they know they are going to deal with the criminals or they are going to deal with the rogue 
young people who don't even understand what they know they they do in life so this these are some of the reasons as to why i really i really felt it was important to have an umbrella that brings these people together and we initiate a conversation that leads towards healing that leads toward achieving peaceful environment that leads toward sustaining peace and security in our communities thank you rose i think that really uh, sets the scene or the context well for the types of violence uh, you have been addressing especially in the genesis of your organization the legend kenya um, but more recently, Rose, uh, you have been active in combating gender-based violence as a specific form of violence you've been witnessing um, sort of increasing within your community. Could you tell us a little bit about this gender-based violence within your community? What have been the ma main causes and effects? Uh, this gender-based violence in the community is not something that began last year as a result of the pandemic. This only escalated it. This is something that has been happening in, in the community. And uh, I remember, I remember like um, way back, a boy will just come, as long as they love you, they will say, you know what, you are my girlfriend from today. But then I didn't understand this was a type of gender-based violence. And you realize it was a, a, such an, a, an, a normal thing that when you have you have such an opportunity, then you cannot decline. Because if you decline, where will you pass when you're going to school? Where will you pass when you're going to, to maybe church? Where will you pass when you're going to the market? So this thing became rampant with time. And the community somehow normalized it. Because a young girl will just get married at the age of 16, 15, and they will use a very normal term. Maybe that one, that one, ah, she's good to go. She can become a woman. Now, during this COVID-19 pandemic, I, I, I received a call and a friend was telling me, Rosie, there is this girl who, is, uh, who has been raped and she's sleeping out and she has kids. So I said, okay, it's late. I cannot go out now. It was around 3 a.m. But tomorrow, the first thing I'll do in the morning, I will reach out to her. I called her and I asked her where she was. She told me where she was and I went. When I went, I asked her, what, what is the problem? What happened? Because I also have some information on how to handle issues of uh, rape when they happen. And she narrated her story and I got to understand that this, uh, she was thrown out of her house because she couldn't pay rent, her house rent. And um, she was sleeping in a complete house. So three men came at night when they were sleeping. And then they, ha, she has two kids. She was 27 years old. And then they pushed these uh, children aside and they raped her. You know, the, the firstborn son was not sleeping and he saw all this happen to her. So this girl was so traumatized and she was really under pressure. So I asked her, let us go uh, to the police station because she has, uh, she had reported it, the case. So I asked her, let us go because you have the medical report. Let us go and follow up so that we know who did this because this happened during curfew hours. During curfew hours, nobody was allowed to be outside apart from security actors. So they they might be they might have a clue if there were some people outside there who are not security actors, they can be able to track them and we might be able to get uh, a hold of these rapists. So when we went there in the morning, I I, I found a policeman and and uh, he's the one who was in charge that day, and. Uh, he pulled us uh, in, in a bench and he was saying, you know, why, why are you following up this thing? You, you are a grown-up woman. You must have enjoyed the act. I was really angry at that man. And I, I told him right in his face, what you're doing is wrong. And I, I'm not going to talk to you about this issue. I want to see the officer commanding this station. I don't think you're the right person we should be talking to. And when we reached out to the to his bosses and they were very sorry and then they were able to pick up this this um, this case. That is not the only case. 
a young girl at the community the mom left because they were very I, they they were that loggerheads with their father this young girl was only eight years old and when mom went she left this young girl behind and this man was sodomizing this girl in both sides so this thing was so rampant during this COVID-19 pandemic. And as I was doing the relief food, distributing food at the community, I come across child-headed families. And some relatives are literally taking advantage of these child-headed families. They bring you food and they, they, they touch you inappropriately. And these girls have nothing to do. They don't even really understand what is happening with the people whom they are used to calling uncles and, and friends of their families. And this thing was really terrible. I picked it up and I've been following up with, with, with support from other friends and other people who are really working on this issue of gender-based violence. But it is not something that just began today. And it is not something that is... Um, is new we began a mentorship program as the legion kenya for young girls who were in school because schools were closed for very long and i used to tell them young girls nobody should touch you inappropriately it's not allowed and it's against the law if this happened let us know and let us follow these people and make sure they are arrested and they are brought to book during this covid 19 pandemic we used to come across fetus, aborted fetus, across our neighborhoods. And this fetus, I don't believe these young girls got pregnant as a result of drinking water inside a glass. Somebody somewhere is responsible. And we know the consequences of uh, having these botched abortions. It's not safe. You don't know what, what will happen in the near future for these young girls. So it was as a way, this mentorship pro program for these young girls was as a way of making sure that we tell them, please take care of yourself, take care of your friends, take care of your sisters, and make sure that when something terrible happens to you, you report it to your parents. If you are not uh, so close, because parents were also busy, they want to feed their families. They cannot be there 24 hours to listen to their children. Just come and talk to us, and we will be able to, to see how to go about these issues. And I don't want to leave out the issue of young boys who are sodomized. Because the people are aware that when you touch a girl child, sometimes they will, they will speak up and they are able to share this and at some point you can be brought to book. The boys really, really, really suffered. And this happened because it is, it is not easy for a, a, a young child, a boy, to just come and tell you, so and so did this to me. But if you have a relationship with this child, then you can be able to get information. So this gender-based violence was not only happening to young girls, it was not only happening to women, it was also happening to the boy child. And I want to bring about the issue of couples, people who are married, gender-based violence in marriages. Women, during this COVID-19 pandemic, you ask your husband for food, money for food, you're beaten up. And this husband is also frustrated. You know, these are casual laborers. They work hand to mouth. So they become angry. The moment you ask for money for food, he's like, where did I get this money from? I have not been working. We are under lockdown. Then you're beaten up. Other women have scars. Other women are just are just too vulnerable to even just go and tell their neighbors you know this is this is what i'm going through and women are so used to keeping quiet and if you ask them tomorrow in the morning what happened to your eye why why do you have this black eye they will just try and even say i i just hit my my eye I, as i was walking along the door you have to get very close to them to understand what is really happening in these houses Rose, thank you. I think you, you really helped paint, paint quite a bleak picture of the reality on the ground and maybe 
you know, made, making all of us more fully aware of the effects of this type of violence. And uh, you also started to touch on some of the approaches that you have taken to addressing this. What other approaches has uh, the legend Kenya undertaken to try and combat gender-based violence? Number one, apart from the mentorship program, we used to provide these young girls with sanitary towels. When we do our food drives, we notice that we give families that have um, moms, we give them we give them a pack of food and one sanitary towel. Then you realize that this is not enough. This is only for their for their mothers. But these young girls, they have no they have no options when when they have their periods. Then they go through a lot of period shame. They, some of them use their mattresses, some of them use their torn clothes. So we used to provide them with sanitary towels because you also realize that some people are taking advantage of these young girls. They will just sleep with you and give you 50 shillings. And you know when you're in your menses, it's such a shame if you don't have a dignity pack. You will do anything to make sure you are on the safer side. These young girls, I, I just saw them the, the vulnerability part of them in a way that if you don't have a sanitary towel, somebody can just decide to take advantage of you just because they are providing this. Another thing that we have really, really, really tried to uh, sensitize the community, we have had community conversations, that gender-based violence is not a women's only issue. This is a communal issue we know that men are suffering too, women are the majority, but as a community, the only way to win this battle is to make sure that we are pulling together and we are speaking in one voice as a community. Another one is that we have, uh, we have really tried to sensitize women and youths on um, UN Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security and UN Resolution 2250 on Youth Peace and Security. When the community understands that we have such policies that protect them, then they will be courageous and confident enough in making their communities peaceful. We have tried to unpack these resolutions in languages that speaks to um, to them at the community level. Because uh, sometimes you cannot just directly um, translate it to them as it is in English. But when we read through with my team, we are able to unpack it in such a way that the community understands, the youths understand, the women understand. Another thing that we continue to do, um, we, are, we, are, we are putting up a shelter, and this shelter will act as a safe space for victims of gender-based violence. The main reason as to why we are putting up this shelter is because at some point you 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 receive some some calls that needs rescue and you know you cannot just bring all of them at your place. It is not safe. The perpetrators know that if it is so and so that rescued my wife or my kids or my husband, then they must be in in in, in, in such a place. So we are trying to put up a shelter it is halfway and we know this is something that is going to be of great 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 support to our communities and we are not just putting it up for purposes of rescue we are putting it up so that we will also be having conversations that speaks to these issues that we face especially the issue of insecurity when it comes to uh, gender-based violence the issues of uh, insecurity when it comes to uh, high insecurity level at the community level as a result of young people directly engaging in um, chaotic um, activities or criminal activities a safe space that will bring together even security actors in, in at the community level to make sure that we are having a conversation we are talking we are not talking against each other we are talking to each other yeah rose thank you uh, just in wrapping up as you sit here before us today what gives you hope for the future amazing <laughs> what gives me hope for the future is seeing how today 
crime is not really celebrated in my community. Even if you are a criminal, it's not like before. People used to really cheer you up and you're that good person. Oh, you're the big boss in the house. We are protected because you come from our family. No. Today, people are celebrating young people who are reforming from criminal activities. Young girls who are reforming even from prostitution. This is a plus because parents are beginning to accept, the community is beginning to accept, and that really gives me hope. Another thing is seeing how young people are no longer taking themselves as perpetrators of violence, but actively engaging in peace-building activities at the community level. It, it really, you have like a sigh of relief when you see such activities happening, and you just feel like, this is something, this is a very bright star that if, if well taken care of, it's going to impact even lives and lives and lives to come long, even, even after we, we are no longer in this world. I feel, I feel happy. I feel proud. I feel, I feel um, encouraged because when you see young people, Coming up to do a cleanup activity during a peace day. When you see young people, or during the International Day of Peace, we were celebrating peace champions at the community level. And these are people you look at and you feel proud of yourself. You feel proud of your community. You feel proud of them. It really encourages me. That is, that is a, a really wonderful way to wrap up our chat. I have no doubt the impact of the work you're doing in your community will be felt for generations to come. Thank you so much for joining us today. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Savannah, for having me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you for watching today's episode of Coffee with Accord. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can receive notifications every time we post a new episode. For more updates, like our Facebook page, African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, or follow us on Twitter or on Instagram at Accord Online. To learn more about Accord, visit our website www.accord.org.za.